Welcome to another episode of Social PR Secrets. My name is Lisa Beyer and I'll be your host. I'm very excited to share with you my guest today is Nathan Hirsch. He is the founder of Outsource School. Do any of these sound familiar? Are you up at two in the morning responding to emails? Are you spending countless hours posting jobs and interviewing, hiring only to find that it's not working out the way you want it to? If you're working 60 plus hours in the business instead of working on the business, this episode is for you. This episode, Nathan is going to share with you some of his systems and processes and some of the ways that you can identify if hiring a virtual assistant is for you and what the possibilities of something like Outsource School can do for you as an entrepreneur or even for your in-house team. So today, welcome Nathan, and I hope that this will inspire you to look at the possibility of hiring a virtual assistant and how it can change your business overnight. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Social PR Secrets. And I am here with my special guest, Nathan Hirsch. Hey, Nathan, how are you? I am great. How are you? Good, good. I'm like, I love your background. Those of you listening can't see it, but it says outsource school. And like today, I wish I could outsource a lot of things that, that were happening to me this morning that I can't wait to dig in and hear all about like the outsourcing world today. So before we get into the subject of outsourcing, can you just share how did you get to the point of ha um, having outsource school as your business and, and how did the idea come up in your journey? Yeah, I think the, the short summary is I started selling textbooks in college to, to make side money. And from there, I learned about Amazon and I started to become an Amazon seller. This was back in 2008, 2009, before uh, Amazon selling got really popular. So I, I got in at a great time. I was scaling this Amazon dropshipping business. I tried hiring college kids, which was an absolute disaster. And from there, a, a buddy of mine told me about the remote hiring world. And I hired my first VA and my second VA and made some good hires, some bad hires. I, I love the idea of it, but it took me years of trial and error to really come up with a, a good hiring process, a good training process, a good managing process. And once I did, my business exploded. And I liked virtual assistants a lot, but I didn't like the other marketplaces out there, the Upworks, the Fivers. It just took too long to post a job, get 100 people to apply, interview them one by one. And I wanted something faster. So I ended up building my own marketplace called FreeUp that pre-vetted VAs and freelancers, matched them up with clients quickly, had great support, great protection on the back end. And we took it to market with a minimum viable product. And we scaled that from a $5,000 investment to doing over $12 million in revenue by year four. And we were acquired by one of our clients at the end of last year, which is a whole nother story we can get into if you want. But from there, once we finished the transition period and we have a great relationship with the new owners and they're doing a great job, um, people started reaching out and asking us how we did it because not only was our Amazon business completely run by virtual assistants, but this eight figure marketplace of freelancers, our internal team was just virtual assistants in the Philippines. We had no office, no US employees. And so we set out to build Outsource School, which started off as an idea, but eventually turned into this membership where for $1,000 a year, you get access to three things. The first thing is our exact hiring process that we help you implement into your business. The second is all of our SOPs, our processes that you can implement in your business quickly for operations and marketing and have virtual assistants do it, give that to your team. And then third is a software that we built called Simply SOP that is very easy to create and store and share your SOPs with your virtual assistants. And we teach you how to do that. And you also get our support in our community. So that kind of progressed over time. And we have hundreds of members now, and it's been a lot of fun just contributing to the digital entrepreneur space. So that's a short version of how I went from books to baby products to free up to, to now outsource school. Well, that's an awesome story. And um, I remember I was listening to your interview on Hustle and Flowchart, your whole story. And I was like, oh, Nathan is so awesome. That's so just like the, the coolest, you know, stories and your journey and now what you're doing with outsource school and then like literally like the next day i had this dm in my facebook messenger from you like 
because we just happen to live in the same town. We both live in Orlando, in the Central Florida area. I was like, oh, this is like magic. I listen to Hustle and Flow Chart, and then I get a direct message from, from Nathan. Um, and, you know, so coming in from the public relations world and digital marketing world, I've, um, you know, kind of dabbled in virtual assistants, and, and I've always been a little bit gun shy of, of the whole concept of it um, for trust and then where do you start and what's the right thing to outsource and you know so the can you just kind of start with some of those like I'm sure other people business owners share those same concerns yeah and I think there's a, a lot of objections I'll, I'll kind of start with the the confusion that I think people have there, there's three levels of hiring there's followers doers and experts now when i say the word virtual assistant i'm just talking about followers people non-us five to ten bucks an hour that are there to follow your systems your processes if you don't have systems and processes you're going to really struggle to hire those followers then you've got the doers the graphic designers writers video editors the specialists they're there to do a particular project to add a a certain level um, and you're not teaching someone how to be a graphic designer they're not consulting with you and then you got the experts high-level freelancers consultants agencies coaches they bring their own systems their own processes their own strategy to the table they can consult they can project manage all of that so I mean it's always a good place to start learning how to hire the followers because you're going to have to learn how to hire you can either do it through trial and error like we did or you can use something like outsource school to accelerate the process but it's a lot better to start off learning how to hire the followers because the risk is a lot lower like worst case scenario you make a bad hire on the followers you lose a few hundred bucks few thousand bucks you make a bad hire on the doers or experts that can get a lot more expensive very quickly so i think from there once you understand the levels then it comes down to understanding the real risk because I think entrepreneurs, they're, they're all about risk, right? To some level. But when it comes to actually giving away tasks to their, their baby, their business, they find that difficult to do a lot of times. And for me, you have to understand that if you don't hire, you're going to hit a level in your business, like very quickly, a lot quicker than you think. I remember my Amazon business plateaued when I couldn't hire. I talk to entrepreneurs every day who think, okay, I'll start off working 40 hours, then 50, then 60, then 70. At some point you can't work any hours anymore and you need time off and all of that. So if you're not going to hire, you're only going to grow your business so much and you're really just going to have a job. The other way that I like to flip it is when you hire virtual assistants, the average virtual assistant cares so much more about providing for their family and keeping them as a client or staying on the marketplace that they're on or getting referrals from you than they do about stealing or jeopardizing or hurting your business in some way. And there's always going to be a risk. Like even if you hire your best friend to sit right next to you, there's always a chance they do something stupid, but the risk is a lot lower than people think. And we teach you a lot of tactics to reduce that risk, to build relationships, to create family, to motivate them, to get them to buy in to your company. But you have to understand the levels. You have to understand the risk is lo lower than you think. And you have to understand that hiring is the only way to grow your business. There's very few million dollar a year entrepreneurs out there. And the beauty of hiring virtual assistants is you don't have to hire 35 people full time. Like that's what I had at FreeUp, but I didn't wake up one day and hire 35 people. I started off with a VA for five hours a week, got some time back, reinvested that time into bigger tasks, increased their hours, hired a second VA, and you can build up from there. So when the example you just gave, so your first VA that you hired, what was, give us that example. Walk us through your first VA and how, how did you decide what to give that VA? And then the second one and the third, just to kind of give the idea of how you build. So my mentality for, for all my businesses is my first two hires are a bookkeeper and someone to get me out of my inbox because bookkeeping is something you want done correctly. You don't want to have to redo it. Uh, most entrepreneurs, including me, are not very good at bookkeeping. We don't like bookkeeping. And if I'm spending time on my bookkeeping, I'm not out there growing my business. So I like to get someone in there. It's usually very affordable, five hours a month usually to start, especially if you don't have a revenue stream yet, um, 25 bucks a month-ish, give or take 10, 20%. So getting someone out there who can set up all your accounts, get everything into zero or QuickBooks, send you reports every month so you know how your business is doing and you can actually make decisions based on those reports. And they don't do your taxes, you still have an accountant, but they make sure that you're not overpaying for your accountant to do bookkeeping work. And then my second hire is someone to get me out of my inbox because inbox are notorious time wasters. When I wake up every day, 
I'm a big proponent in doing my most important thing right when I wake up. So if I wake up and the first thing I'm doing is spending an hour clearing my inbox, that's going to destroy the rest of my day. So I have a VA who will handle 80% of my emails, book my meetings, schedule my podcast, whatever it is, and they'll leave important emails for me. Like if my accountant emails me, my lawyer emails me, whatever it is, they'll leave those for me. But when I wake up, I respond to one to five emails instead of an hour of emails. And then I get started working on my most productive task. Again, very affordable, one to two hours a day, five bucks an hour. So we're talking uh, not even 50 bucks a week or so. So, I mean, yeah, it, those are my first two hires part-time to get me a head start in all my businesses. Okay. Speaking of inbox, so you're my hero. So I, I really want to talk a little bit more about the inbox because a lot of people have this problem, especially in the public relations world, especially journalists, if they're listening, digital marketers, maybe, but, um, what are some, did you have a system in place that you gave your VA for how you manage your inbox? Like, can you give some tips on inbox management? Yeah. And this is one of my favorite parts about outsource school is we have playbooks for everything. And we're, if we don't have it out yet, we're coming up with it or we'll have a partner make it, but we have a, a playbook called the inbox management playbook. And it walks you through step-by-step step exactly how we set it up with your VA. And there's a certain element of following the steps and making sure that the virtual assistant understands each step and masters each step before you move to the next one. For example, the first step is you want them to understand your business. If they don't understand your business, they're not going to be very good at respect and responding to your inboxes. So before they jump into the inbox and start reading emails and checking out canned responses, have them just review your website, listen to your podcast, watch all the videos you have, and then test them and ask them questions and make sure they really understand your business. From there, you're going to show them any types of canned responses that you get, and you're going to start to map out the different types of emails that you get. And we help you do this in the playbook where you're like, hey, these are potential customers. These are current customers. This is my accountant, lawyer, outside stuff. This, these are networking calls. Every inbox is a little bit different, but you're able to break it down into categories and then turn those categories into subcategories. So for example, the, the potential client, they might have a confusion, they might have a question, they might have a complaint, they might have, they might have signed up for a free trial and each one of those has its own canned response that you then give it. So as you break down your inbox and this doesn't take very long to do and you don't even need to do 100% of it, you can do 50% of it and as new emails come in, just add to it, you're going to be able to create this and give it to your virtual assistant, check their drafts before they send it out. And within a week or less, you can have a VA handling 70% of your emails. And then you kind of build it up from there on what trust level you have with them. Great tips. It must've been um, liberating when you uh, sold free up and started a whole new email um, address with outs outsource school. So you could start fresh, right? <laughs> Yeah, my, my lifestyle's drastically changed. I mean, I still work remote and all that, but I mean, free up is just, it's just a lot of people, right? A lot of freelancers, a lot of clients and all that, where uh, outsource school having a, a small knit membership is, is definitely a different um, lifestyle. But yeah, it's, it's been, it's been fun. Like I get to give back to the entrepreneurial space. I love VAs. I love people in the Philippines. We donate 3% of all sales to our favorite charity, Teach for the Philippines. So it's definitely our way to, to give back while still uh, benefiting from uh, having a, a, a different lifestyle. That's awesome. So what are, is there, um, if somebody's just starting out, so your example that you gave, you started out with the bookkeeper and then the inbox, is that typically, do you have a, a recommendation of taking baby steps? Is that the, the typical sequence? Or um, if somebody asks, where, should, where do I get started? How do I know what to delegate? Yeah, everyone has a different roadmap and we'll even meet with our members and figure out what makes sense to them. I think I'm in a place where that makes sense to me. If I'm going to start a startup, I don't want to be doing my bookkeeping. I don't want to be doing my inbox, but I've also made a good amount of money in the past. And I know that people starting off, they, they might not want to spend that $25 a month. They might need to get revenue maybe a little bit faster than, than I do. So there's other marketing techniques that we teach that to have virtual assistants do like getting on podcasts. I know you heard me on a podcast. I know you go on podcasts. You have your own podcast. Getting on podcasts when it comes to like spending money is one of the, the most efficient, cheapest way to go about it. It's a lot cheaper than running Facebook ads and other things. And not that it's a get rich quick thing, but if I'm starting a business and I have to really monitor every dollar that I'm spending. 
one of the first places I might start is using our podcast outreach formula where we have a virtual assistant again, an hour or two a day doesn't cost very much, but finding relevant podcasts and pitching them because that's how I grew free up from a, a $5,000 investment to eight figures in four years without spending any money on ads. Now there's a time commitment there. You have to go on the podcast and running ads, although it's more expensive to pay money for ads, you don't necessarily have to go on a podcast every week or every day or whatever your frequency is, but there are alternatives to fit whatever kind of business you want to set up, whatever your situation is. So that's, I love that example because, you know, we're here talking about social PR secrets and um, I love talking about how, you know, a lot of brands, they, they love doing social ads because it's, it's immediate gratification. You know, you're going to get ROI and you can kind of predict what you're going to get. But with public relations, um, some brands are like, oh, you know, we'll try it for a month. We'll try it for a few months. But I mean, public relations is, is, a, is a commitment that you never turn off. It's something that you keep, keep going. And I, I just love the example of that you, you know, didn't spend any money on ads, or maybe you did eventually, but you started off on podcasts, which is basically the same as, you know, in general, media outreach, media coverage, which is considered, you know, X times more, more credible than any ad would. So I, I love that example. Or, um, so from a public relations standpoint, let's just say somebody's just starting out or they have a PR agency, what are some examples that a PR that we can use for outsourcing? Yeah, I mean, if you want more stuff on the marketing side, so we talked about podcasts. When yeah. I say podcast, it, it could be summits, it could be Facebook Lives, it could be webinars, you can use VAs for all of that. VA is for lead generation. We have a lead generation formula where you're using it to reach out to clients. You can do it via email. You can do it via LinkedIn and have a virtual system behind the scenes um, getting uh, leads for you. We have an influencer playbook. And this is one of my personal favorites is finding people that have communities of your ideal client and having a VA collect all of those and send them to you every day. And you or the biz dev person, your team, depending on how big you are, reaches out to them and builds relationships and gets them to promote you. We have the partnership playbook playbook, which I'm a big proponent of with, by the time we um, sold free up, we had over 500 partners where every single quarter we were doing content swaps with them, which was great for backlinks. It was great for getting in front of their community. And so you can have a VA run your entire partnership program where again, you're finding other communities and an example of that, and you can do this in PR too. Let's say I'm a, a PR company for marketing agencies. All right. Well, I, I would go to every marketing software out there and be like, hey, you don't provide PR services. I don't provide marketing software. Let's partner together. Let's do content swaps together. I'll have my VA set it up with your team and every quarter, every six months, whatever frequency you want to do, we'll reach out to you and we'll set up a blog post. We'll set up a podcast swap. We'll set up a YouTube video. Hey, we've done even VIP networking dinners back in the day when you could actually see people in person. <laughs> um, so you can get creative there. But those are great things to have running behind the background in the background. So there's so much you can do on the marketing side. I mean, if you're talking about operations, well, if you're going to be pitching all these media outlets, you can have a VA doing that research, doing the pitching. You can have a VA doing your customer service, your bookkeeping. When we already talked about bookkeeping, but what if your customers reach out to you? They have a question. They want to upgrade. You can teach your VAs to do upselling and sales in there too. You can even have your VAs do phone calls. I have that with Outsource School. We did that with Free Up where a VA would get on the phone and answer questions and it's very affordable. So you can, once you start thinking about all the things you can outsource and start prioritizing it and kind of break it down into operations versus marketing, there, there's endless possibilities about what you can do. I love it. I love it. And what are some examples that you can give that from a social media or public relations, you, you said you use podcast interviews to grow free up. What else did you do from a PR or social media that really worked and what didn't work? Yeah. So I mentioned the influencers, right? So we would have a VA that would um, figure out or find all the contact information for influence in the space. We'd reach out to them and then we'd have a VA create a free up page for for them. So it'd be freeup.com slash Alex Sharfin, freeup.com slash whatever the influencer's name was. And that influencer would promote that page. And in addition, when people would search free up, they'd all of a sudden they'd see all these influencers popping up. And that's really good. That helps us uh, with social proof. And it would start showing up on, on SEO searches and, and all of that. Um, I mean, on social media, again, sharing the podcast, you're, if you're going to go on podcasts, you're going to be putting out all this content, have a VA, we have a video editing playbook, 
take those and repurpose them. We're doing that now on our YouTube channel. Where we'll take clips of this podcast and other ones. We're not going to steal the podcast you recorded, but we will take a clip and put it on YouTube and direct people back to your podcast. It's again, building that social proof. And it's also great for keywords and other stuff. So a lot of that, once you're, you're doing that outreach and you're going on podcast summits, webinars, you get in that great media outlet, you can use that and repurpose that in a lot of different ways across your other channels which is a lot of manual work, but you can have a virtual assistant do all of it. Yeah, so Nathan, I think we both drank the same Kool-Aid or martinis or whatever you wanna, we're on the same page. Um, you know, talking to other, you know, just for example, clients or prospects or di speaking at different events, you know, we'll get the question as, well, if you do all that, you know, what's, what's the ROI? How do you really measure that that's working? So when you were doing it, what were some of the ways that you were measuring that it was working that, you know, this made sense to, you know, to you to take this and repurpose it on YouTube, for example, but any example. So what, how are you measuring? Yeah. So I'm actually want to pull up a document <laughs> right now that I just, so we create a, a KPIs that we track each week and we yeah. have a VA that goes through and, and does it. So a good example for YouTube, we track uh, six things. So organic views, organic impressions, impressions, click through rate, views and impressions from YouTube search, views from Google search, net subscribers gained. So again, this is a long-term play. You're not going to get 100,000 YouTube subscribers overnight, but you can track the progress of it week by week and see if it's going up. And then you can tweak your strategy there. You can do the same thing for social media. You can do the same thing for podcasts. In our podcast average formula, we have a, a cheat sheet that we give you that's a you can fill out and it helps you follow up with podcasts, keep track of podcasts that you're on, and then you communicate this across teams. So whenever I go on a podcast and I'm a assuming that at the end of this, whenever it goes live, you're going to shoot me an email and say, Hey, Nate, your podcast is live. Well, my VA is going to grab that email, add it to a document, pass it over to my social media team, and we'll repurpose it. And then we're going to track how many views it gets and we'll blast it out to our newsletter. So you can set up all these systems with KPIs for you to track every single week or every single month. Those are great tips. So on the entrepreneur side, um, what are some, what are some of your secrets to success and, and what is, a typical day look like for you? So I, I talk mm -hmm. about this in, in our calendar management playbook. I mean, one of my biggest secrets is I figure out, I figured out what my ideal day looks like. Like, what do I, what does my perfect day look like where I'm not crazy stressed, I'm productive, I'm happy, I'm enjoying it um, and, and all of that. And for me, my ideal day is I wake up at seven, from seven to nine, I do my most important of the day from nine to 10, I work out. I just finished a really intense workout. I do one a day. Then I do one podcast a day, one a day. You're my one podcast today. I like doing it between 11 and 2 PM somewhere in the middle of the day. If it's too early, I won't be good. If it's too late, I, I, I don't like it when it's too late. So one podcast and then the rest of my day is meetings or phone calls. I, you mentioned that I reached out to you on Facebook. I try to do a few networking calls every week, just meeting other entrepreneurs. Um, and then from there, uh, you have like team meetings. I, I talk to my partner, stuff like that, wrap up my day around three, spend time with my dogs, my fiance, uh, and, and all of that and, and so on. So for me, that's my ideal day. For you, you might be most productive between 2 a.m. and 4 p.m., which is or 2 a.m. And, and 4 a.m., which is fine, but you need to make sure you're maximizing that every single day. And it takes tweaking. It took me years to figure out my, my ideal day. But once you have that ideal day, then you have your virtual assistants hold you to it. They're managing your calendar. They're managing your inbox. They're, they're scheduling podcasts. Like if you reached out to me and you're like, Hey, Nate, I, I need to schedule this podcast with you. My VA is going to say, Hey, sorry, Nate only does one podcast today. He's booked out until October. And yeah, maybe there's some exceptions to that rule, but for the most part, you try to keep that ideal day as much as possible. How many podcast interviews have you done, do you think? I, I say 300 on my profile, but I feel like it's closer to 500 when you factor in like free up and outsource school combined. I do one a day now. Back when I did, back when I was in free up in my podcasting prime, I had a week where I did five podcasts a day, five days in a row, like Monday through Friday and 25 podcasts in a week. And after that, it was like a breaking point. And I was like, all right, I can't do more than one a day going forward, but I've done a lot of podcasts. Yeah. And I think that's a good rule to have. Um, I don't recommend clients to do more than two interviews a day because you, you just don't have the energy. You have a lot of energy. So I think you can do two a day for sure. 
I can do it, but it's all about that, that ideal day. And if I'm doing podcasts, that's time I'm not spending on other stuff. And I mean, podcasts are great. Like they're great for brand awareness and getting in front of hundreds of or thousands of people, but it's also great for networking and meeting people in your space. It's great for SEO and backlinks. A lot of people don't think of, it's great for snowballing effects that lead to bigger podcasts, bigger speaking appearances, whatever it is. So there's a ton of benefits. I always recommend people go on at least one a week. Yeah. Well, during the pandemic, um, since the pandemic started, I've been doing a lot more podcasts each week for sure. And it's definitely helped keep like the energy and the vibe going, you know, from, you know, working from home or being, staying at home so much. Uh, did you have any breakthroughs that happened during the pandemic? Like a lot of people, you know, launched different things, came up with different ideas. What was, what's it been like for you? And how did you get, make it this far, you know, with such a positive energy? <laughs> yeah. Keep in mind, I was kind of in a weird position because I had sold my business in November of last year. So I kind of skipped the whole like March, April, where I think every entrepreneur was like freaking out a little uncertain on some level. Um, but then I also was launching a new business and we launched actually the week that COVID hit in the U S which is a weird time to start a business. Um, and we also just don't have anything to compare it to, right? Like we don't have 2019 numbers to compare how April was last year to April this year. So I think, I think for for us, it was kind of like, it was like, all right, let's use this time to educate ourselves, to build stuff out, to build a good team, to form processes and, and know that eventually this is going to pass. And regardless, we're in a good industry anyway, because everything's moving remote and people need to hire VAs and, and stuff like that. So I think for us, it was just, let's stay focused. Let's use this time. Like I, I we sold free up. I, I made a lot of travel plans for this year, all of which got canceled. So I can, I can either sit on my couch and watch Netflix or I can learn stuff and read books and, and build outsource school. And there's always a balance of both. But my point is we, we kind of just use this time to, to focus and hopefully build a good foundation of something new. You mentioned that you work out for an hour a day. What, what are your favorite types of workouts that you think that other people could benefit from? So I'm a big fan of interval training. So like today it was four rounds, three, four exercises per round, 60 seconds per exercise. And you do three sets of each round. So um, that, that's usually the, the kind that I do big full body cardio. I don't do really heavy weights. Um, I try to avoid those at, at all costs. Uh, yeah. Much more about just flexibility and endurance and cardio and, and full body. That's kind of my whole mantra. Where do you find your creativity? What, what inspires you? Good question. Um, I, so what, some of the best creativity that I have is when Connor, my business partner and I, he's in Denver, I'm in Florida, although I'm trying to move to Denver now. We'll just walk and talk. We'll just walk on the phone and just talk about anything. We'll talk about the accounting team. We'll talk about marketing. We'll talk about ideas we had for playbooks and for outsource school. And we'll just come up with stuff. And, and for, for me, every week, I really look forward to that call or two. And we talk outside of that, but the brainstorming calls where we just are throwing stuff at the wall and maybe 10 ideas we come up with are stupid, but then one or two are awesome. And we were able to implement them and prioritize them. So for me, it's kind of just getting away from my phone, getting away from my computer. At least I'm not on my phone. I'm listening to it and just talking it out with someone that I trust and rely on a lot. And that's been good for me. So movement, movement triggers your creativity. So yeah. you mentioned you have a partner. Is there a playbook for success in having a business partner? <laughs> Um, I don't have one of those, although the biggest tips that I'll give are find someone that has the same values and beliefs as you do. So they, you want someone with opposite skill sets. Uh, Connor's a, I'm much more like high energy, rah, rah. He's much more calm, cool, and collective. Um, and skill set wise, we're, we're very different. I'm better on podcasts and sales and talking on the phone and customer service. He's much better behind the scenes, marketing funnels, content, all of that. Um, but we have owning up to our mistakes, making things right. We believe in treating people well. Uh, we believe in like customer service and all that. And we want the same thing. We're interested in the same businesses. I've had partnerships in the past that didn't work out just because we saw the businesses going in different directions. So make sure on the core stuff, you're on the same page, but on the actual skill side, you're, you're very, very different because you don't need two of yourself. Great advice. So I've had partners in the past and right now I don't have a partner, but it, it could be a lonely world. Like there's definitely advantages to both. Um, and when you don't have a partner, it's like you need to have a mentor or be part of a mastermind or something so that you have peers that you can reach out to and say, you know, hey, what do you think of this? Or what do you think of that? If you're, if you, if you don't have a business partner. 
Yeah, I, I can see how that can be tough. I mean, I'm super fortunate. And there's a certain element of luck involved. Like Connor was my first employee in college. He was one of the only college kids that I hired uh, that that actually worked out. That was really good. And I eventually made him my business partner. And I mean, he, he re- randomly just responded to a Facebook post I had saying that I was looking to hire someone. So th- there's a, a definitely a luck element involved. And you should be very careful on who you pick a, as a partner. But um, yeah, for me, it's all about values and beliefs. And it's very easy to have a business partner when everything is going well, but it's how, how do you handle stuff when it's not going well? That's when you really see what your business partner is all about. Definitely. And do you um, belong to any masterminds or um, what, what do you do on the side of professional development? Yeah, I'm not any consistent masterminds. I done stuff like baby bath water. I'm actually doing a mastermind uh, this Friday and another one in September. But for whatever reason, that just hasn't been a big part of of my entrepreneurial journey. Although I'm sure I'm missing out on some level. What, um, what sources, what books or blogs or outlets do you get the most out of and what do you recommend? Yeah, I'm a big reader and listener. I, I always have one audio book going on my phone and, and one book that I'm reading at all times. So I just finished Dan Henry's book. Uh, right now I'm listening to Zigli, Zig, Ziglier's, um, what's it, something on selling. Uh, he has a three of them that I'm going to go through on audio book. And the next book that I'm reading in person is one on building sales teams, which I've never done. So it's kind of interesting to kind of learn the, the process of doing that. So I always like to, to pick a topic that I'm not familiar with and get familiar with it. And then from there, depending on how much value I think it'll add to my business, like I just spent the last six months reading everything I could on webinars because I think webinars are going to be a big part of Outsource School. And then I built a master class and a webinar for Outsource School. We'll test it out. I'm sure I'll learn more and then apply it. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's usually how I approach it. So we're talking about virtual assistants. So I just did um, a webinar on, um, on um, AR, VR, and, and artificial intelligence and how that's disrupting public relations. And one of the things that we talked about in the webinar was virtual beings and how, um, I don't know if you've heard of virtual beings, but now you can actually like create a virtual being that could be like a duplicate of you or of me. Like Deepak Chopra has a virtual being that is through machine learning and learning like all of his content so he can send the virtual being to possibly a conference or he the virtual being can be your influencer so <laughs> i just blew my mind a little bit <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll send you the um the the article i just wrote on it yeah it's really crazy i went to the virtual being summit and actually there was um Biz Stone's virtual being, Deepak's virtual being, and two other, I can't remember their names, in a Zoom call. And it wasn't the real people, it was the, the virtual beings. And it was, it's just crazy, the, you know, the direction of technology. So um, that might be part of your, your um, business model is the virtual being soon. How much does it cost to get a virtual being? At about $800 is the starting price. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, I just thought that you would find that interesting. Well, Nathan, this has been amazing. So do you have any last words of wisdom um, circling back to outsource school? Like what are like the top three things somebody needs to know and what is your call to action? Yeah, so Outsource School, like I said, it's a membership for entrepreneurs that want to master hiring a virtual assistants, that want to cut out the trial and the error and get great systems and processes for their business. Go to OutsourceSchool.com slash insider. You can even grab a free trial of the membership. When you do become an insider, you get access to our hiring process, all of our playbooks, all of our formulas. You get unlimited access to our software and support on it. You get our community and Connor, my business partner, and my support and my team support along the way. So it's a lot of fun. I definitely recommend it. It's only $1,000 a year. You can break it down into no interest monthly payments and you can grab a free trial to check it out and even schedule a call with us on the site. Sign me up. (laughs) I'm there. I'm so there. Nathan, thank you so much. And we will circle back with you and see about those virtual beans maybe in about a year. Yeah, I'm going to look into that. (laughs) Okay. Namaste. Thank you for listening to this episode of Social PR Secrets. If you like what you heard, check out the book on Amazon or follow our blog at socialprsecrets.com. This episode was sponsored by The Buyer Group, a social PR agency striving to keep our balance in the digital world, practicing public relations, social media, and search marketing, while occasionally drinking a glass of wine or two for the best creativity and results. Thank you all for tuning in. If you would like to get a free chapter of Social PR Secrets, go to socialprsecrets.com free.